What country before ever existed a century and a half without a rebellion? And what country can preserve its liberties if their rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. It takes little imagination to recognize in Solomonic Israel, as in the American Republic, serious debate about the role and scope of the central government and the role of the leader within that government. In ancient Israel, everybody knows that in theory, the individual tribes should make their own decisions of, by, and for their own people locally. Don't tread on me might well have been the Israelite tribal mantra. But tread Jerusalem does until the air is rife with rebellion. The dissolution of the biblical union has been simmering beneath the surface for quite some time when Solomon the Wise finally passes from the scene. The official line of the biblical text is that the people have forsaken God and worshipped foreign deities Specifically, Ashtoret, goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the Moabite god, and Milcom, goddess of the Ammonites. The monotheist is perennially looking for some spiritual reason, some religious reason behind every calamity. But in so doing, the most valuable political lessons of the sacred text are obscured, if not lost sight of completely. There is no greater case in point than the legacy of Solomon's son and successor, Rehoboam, who heads for the city of Shechem, Shechem, to be properly vested as the new monarch. But the differences between Judah and Benjamin in the south and the other ten tribes in the north are destined to grow under Rehoboam, who fails to realize that only broad and meaningful concessions, including reform of the Jerusalem-centric governmental apparatus, will be sufficient to preserve the disintegrating United Kingdom. We no longer hear of massive building projects or of the throngs of slaves needed to erect them. This, however, is hardly a measure of reform but merely a reflection of the fact that tribal tensions are such a diversion that Solomonic grandeur is now out of the question. As the biblical narrative advances, who should seek out the new king but the exiled Jeroboam, Jeroboam, who comes up from Egypt now that the tyrant Solomon is out of the way. Arranging an audience with Rehoboam Jeroboam, Jeroboam, wants to know what kind of ruler the new king will be. Jeroboam declares, Are we to understand that the wise Solomon, righteous judge and maker of multitudinous proverbs, was a harsh taskmaster? The Bible by the fact that it openly quotes Jeroboam, doesn't attempt to censor him, seems to acknowledge this fact. The erstwhile exile adds a demand. Enough tyranny. 
How about returning to the tribal confederacy we once had under our judges, but lost to a royal house that did exactly what the prophet Samuel had warned it would do? Rehoboam delivers the following message. Ketani ava mi matne avi, vata avi heemis alechem ol kaved, vaani osif al ulchem, avi yiseretchem beshotim, vaani ayaseretchem beakrabim. The scorpion line is a true classic of biblical literature. It's the epitome of everything that might conceivably go wrong with a monarchy. In this candid account of Rehoboam's tyranny, the anti-monarchy current submerged in the narrative since the days of Solomon rises again. It's refreshingly rebellious, anti-establishment, and contemptuous of kingly authority. A full-fledged civil war launched by Jeroboam now pulls away 10 of Israel's 12 tribes. When Rehoboam passes from the scene, his son Aviyah, or Abijah, takes the throne, and Jeroboam attacks him as well. Abijah counterattacks to the north, annexing the hill country around Bethel. As the civil war's seesaw action continues to the next generation, the new northern king, Basha recovers the lost territory by attacking the southern king, Asa, whom the Bible hails throughout his long reign as an emblem of righteousness. According to the biblical editors, the southern kingdom is a mixed bag of good and evil kings. But the rebel north, as we would expect, is universally ruled by wicked rulers. The Jerusalemite king, Asa now appeals directly to a foreign ruler, King Ben-Hadad of Damascus, who presses Basha from the east, seizing eastern Galilee and taking the pressure off Asa. Basha, for his part, must retreat from Judah and return to Tirzah. Order and prosperity are restored to Judah, but the United Kingdom is gone with the wind. Back in the rebel north, there is a new dynasty, strong and vital, headed by a powerful king named Omri. He's little remembered because he is, after all, a northerner, and northern kings are uniformly wicked. But after a power struggle that lasts for years, Omri nonetheless fosters stability and strength and makes his realm a serious rival to Jerusalem. He shifts the northern capital to a city called Samaria, building there an impressive palace to match Jerusalem's royal house. Some archaeologists go as far as to claim that many of the monumental structures attributed to King Solomon, specifically at Megiddo, are in fact the work of King Omri, who they maintain is deliberately written out of much of the biblical narrative. His dynasty, however, will rule over Israel and even briefly over Judah for the next 40 years. The man who inherits the new dynamic dynasty is so thoroughly bashed by traditional commentators down through the centuries that his very name lives in infamy, Ahab. Though son and successor of Omri, he is much better known as the husband of his queen, the daughter of the king of Tyre, who gets an equally bad rap in biblical narrative, Jezebel. Most of what is said about Ahab and Jezebel is probably undeserved. True, Jezebel is a pagan, importing the worship of a foreign deity, Baal, into the northern tribal confederacy. But are they any more despotic than the southern kings with their Jerusalem-centric government and temple-centric religious system? Enter the prophet 
Eliyahu, Elijah, who, while the land is in the grip of a terrible drought, begins wandering through the hills, bedecked in a hairy mantle and loincloth, to bemoan the mounting disloyalty to Israel's God. In a direct challenge to Baal worship imported into the land by Queen Jezebel, the prophet summons King Ahab and all the people to the summit of Mount Carmel, where a great contest will be orchestrated to demonstrate once and for all who is God and who is not. Two altars are constructed, one for Baal and one for the God of Israel. Two bulls are slaughtered and placed one on each altar. Next, they beseech their respective deities to consume the offerings by divine fire. A crowd of 450 prophets of Baal shout and wail for half a day, cutting themselves with knives and spears all in vain. Elijah mocks them. Kisiach v'chisiglo v'chiderechlo u'layashenu v'yikatz. Now it's the prophet's turn to call on his God. Hashem Elohe Avraham Yitzchak v'Yisrael Hayom Yivada ki ata Hashem v'Yisrael v'ani avdecha uvidvarcha asiti et kol hadvarim ha'ele aneini Hashem aneini v'yidu ha'am hazeh ki ata Hashem ha'Elohim Israel's deity promptly sends down a torrent of flame, consuming not only the sacrifice, but the entire altar, including the wood, hay, stubble, and water in the trench. As all the people acclaim Israel's God as the true God, Eliyahu, Elijah, commands that the prophets of Baal be seized. Tifsu et nevie habal ish al yimaled mehem. Elijah, with the help of a mass of like minded insurgents, immediately has them dragged to a valley nearby where he slays one and all. Commentators have opined that monotheism appears to suffer throughout its long history from the sin of intolerance. And they point to Elijah's bloodletting as a case in point. Clearly, the prophet's grand scheme doesn't work, for he ends up fleeing for his life to a cave on Mount Sinai to hide himself from the wrath of Ahab and his humiliated dynasty. There on the holy mountain, a number of special effects manifest themselves to Elijah. A mighty wind an earthquake, a fire. But God is in none of them. Finally, a gentle breeze blows. This is how the prophet meets his God. Elijah's great reform has ended in failure, but his legacy will linger forever. According to tradition, he is taken up into heaven on a chariot of fire, but will return one day to usher in the Anointed One, the Mashiach, the Messiah. That's why every year at Passover, an empty chair is set for Elijah. And why at the end of the festive meal commemorating the exodus from Egypt, the door is opened to see whether Elijah may have come to this home on this day. There is one sad episode that relates the despotism that is now commonplace in the North as well as the South. We're told of a man named Navot, Naboth, the owner of a vineyard on the eastern slope of a hill not far from Ahab's palace. The Israelite king covets it, wanting to convert it to a garden of herbs, 
More likely, it is to be a ceremonial garden for Baal worship, which, as far as the southern editors of the narrative are concerned, means that Ahab already has at least two strikes against him. Navot, Naboth, however, is forbidden by biblical law to sell since he has inherited the land from his father. And for that reason, it must remain in his family in perpetuity. Ahab returns to his ivory palace, overcome with depression, an obvious case of overreaction. That's when Jezebel gets involved. Is this how you act as king over Israel? She mockingly asks and goes on to pronounce that she will obtain the vineyard on his behalf. The conniving queen plots against the unsuspecting vine dresser, staging a mock trial. An unnamed court writer in the southern kingdom, hardly neutral when it comes to the north, describes what went down. On news that the grisly deed has been perpetrated, Ahab, on his wife's urging, takes the coveted vineyard as his own. As Ahab stands contemptuously in Naboth's vineyard, the prophet Elijah declares, Oddly enough, King Ahab gets it, going into deep repentance. Consequently, it should come as no surprise that when Ahab subsequently finds himself besieged by Ben-Hadad of Damascus, who, as we noted, has been invited by King Asa of Damascus to harass the north, he manages to hold his own against the Syrian invader. He holds up for safety in his ivory palace in Samaria and survives the siege, much to the chagrin of Jerusalem. At the end of the episode, it becomes clear that the rebel north is not about to be vanquished. Do the northern kings deserve the bum rap they most certainly get from the court chroniclers of the biblical narrative, which, after all, is the literary product of the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, there is an issue to wrap our collective brains around. Thank you.